Hey, welcome to Taylor's Trick Taking Table. I'm SpongeBob. And I know I have just been covering Kickstarter after Kickstarter after new release after new release after Kickstarter after Kickstarter. And I apologize. I don't intend for the channel to be this way. They just all lined up this way. But we have another hot one coming for you. If you recall on the channel, we covered Tricky Time Crisis by John Barron. And I am bias, huge bias here because John not only is a pal, but also sent me the games that we're covering today. But I am a big fan of Tricky Time Crisis. It may be my favorite, must not follow. One of them. Just, they've just been getting better and better. I feel like after Potato Man, they're, you know, it's cranking up. It's so great. Aurum, oh man, there's so many. But, so, John Baron of Baron John Games <laughs> is doing a Kickstarter that has Tricky Time Crisis 2 right now. Huh? That's already an amazing hook. And also two games that we're gonna cover today, Trick or Bid and Tip of the Diceberg. One by him, by John Barron, and then another by Jeremy Zero. That's Trick or Bid. But also there's a fourth game, one I actually haven't played. Boo. I think that one is about, I probably shouldn't say the hook. <laughs> you probably should just check the Kickstarter for the hook. But I think it's where you can once per hand grab the power because it's about legally distinct man he's and you grab the power and that boosts your card ranks for the rest of the game but the later you grab it the more it will boost your card ranks so it's kind of like this tension of do i grab it now do i grab it now or how long do you wait but the hooks that are of the games that i have played i probably should explain uh, we have trick or bid where the hook is during the trick taking, you can just take the trick if you win the trick, or if you're winning the trick, you could instead take one of your opponent's cards, one of the ones they played, as your bid on number of tricks you think you're going to win. So say for example, I play a five, you play a two and a three. I'm like, hmm, do I just take this trick? Or do I think I'm gonna bid two or a three? But it's bid as you play, bid as you go, which I always love. So that is the hook to trick or bid. And then we have tip of the diceberg. So, this is a climbing shedding game must not follow. Yeah, well, we've covered a game like this in the past. It was called Sumida River by Mashi Kamaro, which we loved. Another grain of sand, grain of sand, <laughs> grain of salt, because Mashi Kamaro is a pal. But this is very, very similar. It's must not follow climbing shedding, but with dice. And also the must not follow, what you must not follow can change a bunch throughout if you want a bunch of variety so it's not just like stagnant static like it is in sumina river also the dice make it wild especially because lowest is highest so it's like a climbing shooting game but you're not climbing you're sinking like an iceberg huh get it but that is the other game so trigger bid tip of the diceberg legally distinct power man game and then tricky time crisis too so check that out Woo! john sent me this game so Huge grain of salt, but let's go to the table and I'll show you how to play these two, at least. All right, see you there. Here we have the deck of Tip of the Diceberg. So it has cards and dice, depending on the player count. You might actually remove one of each of these dice. They go from D4s all the way up to D20s. And the cards pretty much mirror that. So there's a D4 suit that is only from one to four, or like this D6 suit that is from one to six. However, the cards really only go kind of high enough, depending on the player count. So at three players, you'll actually remove anything nines or higher. And then at five players, you'll have everything, right? Here we have a game set up for three players. So at three players, you're gonna move one of each of the dice in the pool. You're gonna roll the pool, no matter the player count. Also, you're going to have the six standards set up at three and four. At five player, you'll have another special one, as you can see the five on the bottom there. And then depending on the player count, you're gonna deal one per player. So since we have three players, we're gonna have three of these special kind of power laden melds. These are all melds that players will be playing to. It's a climbing shedding game where these are the melds that players will play to. These on the left are just the standard ones. Players are gonna get shuffled the deck and dealt 12 cards each. The deck, you know, obviously changes depending on the player count. Since we have the three player game here, nothing 
nine or higher is in the deck. So starting with the start player, let's say it's this block here, players are going to do a snake draft of the dice pool. So this player here sees this one, they're gonna grab it because ones that are stronger in the game because it's the lower number that is stronger in the game. This player over here is gonna grab that. Maybe this player grabs the three and then since it's a snake draft, this, I think that's Japanese <laughs> die, is going to draft again. So maybe they grab the four, this player grabs the five and then this player, grabs this six. So this player will then start the climbing shedding. So looking at their hand, they can play anywhere they want. And the lowest number in what they play is going to dictate the strength of what they play. So they see right here, a three card die or sequence run. So what's cool about their hand, they have an eight, seven, six. They could use the six card or they could use the die, their equivalent in their hand. So actually they're gonna do that. They're gonna play seven or eight, seven, six. And you just always put the lowest on top because that is what players will be playing off of in the climbing shedding. And you can play the same number. So it's gonna to go to the next player. They are looking at their hand. So they can't play any of these sevens unless it's part of a run. So in fact, let's say they do that. They're gonna do seven, six and a two card run. Cause again, they, just, they can play the same number, they can match, and their lowest was six, so they're gonna play there. You can never play to the same spot as someone else. So until this trick gets cleared, no one can play a two card run or a three card run. Coming to this player over here, so they're looking at their hand. Maybe they did really want to play a three card run. No, oh, no, there you go. Like, yeah, maybe they wanted to play the three, four, five, but they can't. So they're just gonna play a single card. Maybe they're gonna play a five up here to the single odd. So now it's five, which is the lowest. A player can pass if they want to, like let's say it comes to this L player here, they could, you know, play a two to the single two, or they could play two pair. But if they wanted to, they could pass. When you pass, you may take a die from the die pool. So maybe they're looking over here and they really wanted a six, maybe they pass and they take that six. Coming to this wooden die player, maybe they are looking at their hand and they wanna pass as well, but they don't wanna take a die. So they'll just pass. When players pass consecutively, that is going to clear the trick and the last person who did not pass, this Japanese die up here, will lead to the next trick. So they're gonna just remove everything. So now what's cool about this is now players can play into these melds that were blocked before. The other interesting thing is when a trick gets cleared, you're actually gonna grab the dice in the dice pool. And you're gonna re-roll them because you know they could get a little stagnant as the game goes on. So then this person's going to lead. And so we've covered kind of some of the simple ones. We have pairs, triples, singles, you know, odd or even, but let's look over at these fun ones. So this is a single D6 or D12. And again, your cards are just like your dice. So Maybe this player over here, they wanna play a D, let's see, maybe a D12. They're gonna play an eight D12. And what it says right here is, you may re-roll a die in your die pool up to three times. So maybe they don't want a four. They're gonna re-roll, they got a five, they're gonna re-roll, they got an eight. Oh, thank goodness, they got a one. So then it's gonna to go to the L here. An important thing to know, it's soft pass, meaning if a player passed and the trick was still going, they could come back in. So like, let's say this L player passed and they took this red three. It comes to the blue player, they play a single odd, they play the five up there. Then it comes to this player over here, the Japanese die, maybe they play a pair of threes. It could come to this L and they are valid plays. They could play, you know, triple threes if they wanted to. So Full Like This is going to continue until one player sheds out. They are going to get three points. Play will continue until another player sheds out, then they'll get two points. And then a third player shedding out will get one point unless it's a three player game, then that last player will get zero points. You're gonna shuffle, redeal, and keep playing until a player gets six points. But the interesting thing is you're actually going to shuffle and redo these. So these will always be new and play different every round. The starting player in later rounds is whoever is losing cover some of these other ones. This is five odds, which is cool. But also after you do that, you may discard a card or a die from your hand, helping you shed sooner. Or maybe a pair flush. So they have to be the same number and the same suit. So maybe a three and a three. And that's how to play Tip of the Diceberg. The deck in Trick or Bid is made up of four suits, numbered zero through nine, mostly. There's actually double copies of ones, twos, and threes. 
Here we have the game of Tricker Bid set up for three players. So if you're playing with three players, you'll remove one suit. Four players, you'll have all the cards in. No matter the player count, you're going to shuffle the deck and deal 13 cards to each player. Tricker Bid is a must-follow game. So let's say we started with the pumpkin over here and say they played the seven green. Coming to the wolf ears, they would have to play one of their green cards. So maybe they play the eight. And then finally, Reese's comes and plays the four. So the trick winner in Tricker Bid is the player who played the highest card of the lead suit, unless Trump is determined, and then it would be the highest Trump card if there is one. But at the start of the game, there's no Trump. So the highest card of the lead suit was the wolf ears. They'll win the trick. And what they can do, trick or bid, is they can take the trick or they can bid. And how bidding works is you're going to look at the cards that your opponents played, and you're judging, is the rank on one of those cards the number of tricks I think I'm going to hit? throughout the 13 card hand. So the wolf is looking at the hand, they're like, eh, I'm not really sure. I don't think I'm gonna take seven or four. I'm just gonna take this trick. So when you take the trick, you just pick it up, just like a normal trick taking game and lead to the next trick. So it's again, must follow coming to the pumpkin over here. Let's say they play a three. So now the wolf is in the same position. They're like, oh, I got a trick. Do I think I'm gonna take a zero or a three? Maybe they do think they're gonna take the three. So what happens here is instead of taking the trick, they're actually going to bid. So they're going to look at which card they want to take. They're definitely not going to take the zero because they already took a trick. So they're going to take the three. So they're going to put that in front of themselves and they actually discard this trick. So they don't get the trick if they bid with it. So it just goes out of the game until the next round, obviously, but for this hand out, and then they would lead to the next trick. But an important thing is the first time someone bids, the suit that is used for that bid is now Trump for the rest of the hand. So this moon black suit is now the Trump suit. So the bear wolf is gonna lead again. Continuing the trick, let's say the pumpkin is out of green. So they trump in and play the black. So they would win the trick. And they have the same thing. Do they think they're gonna win three tricks, six tricks, or they just wanna take it? Let's say they just take it. So flow like this is going to continue for the 13 tricks, except when someone plays same rank, which I'll show now. In this trick example, the pumpkin and the werewolf both played a two and the Reese's pumpkin played a one. So since they are the same rank, they're actually gonna cancel each other out and the remaining card is going to win. So even though it's a one, it actually won this trick. And the Reese's pumpkin does the same thing. Do they think they're gonna take two tricks or they just wanna take the trick itself? Maybe they do think they're gonna take two tricks. And once a player has a bid, they can't rebid. So in this situation, since the wolf and the Reese's have already had a bid, they can just take tricks from now on. Rolling back that example, let's say it did look like this, and maybe Reese's was off suit. What's interesting is it's highest the lead suit that wins or Trump, but in this case, Reese's was not playing the Trump or the lead suit, and since these cancel each other out, no one won this trick. When this happens, you're actually gonna set the trick aside and then play another trick. With those cards set aside, the previous leader will actually lead again into the next trick, and then the winner of that trick is gonna win both the set aside trick and the next one. So in this example, let's say it looked like this. Well, the pumpkin had the highest of you know Trump and the lead suit, so they're gonna win this trick and that trick. If edge case wise, this was the last trick of the hand, that would just get discarded. So like this is going to continue for the 13 tricks, and then at the very end, you're gonna see how players score, so we'll jump to that. Here we are at the end and here we have the scoring. It says at the end of the hand, players score one point for each trick they have won. Additionally, if a player has won exact number of tricks as their bid, they'll score four point bonus. And if a player bid zero and has zero, they score seven points as a bonus instead of four. So looking at the situation here, the wolf player bid three and they took four sadly. So they're only gonna get four points and not the bonus. Whereas the pumpkin over here, bid two and they got two so they get one two plus four that's six points down here the reese's they got zero points or they took zero tricks but sadly they didn't bid zero so they didn't get any points at all if during the trick play if they would have done something like this where maybe you know they were trumping in and one of their opponents had played a zero like this they could have won taken this as a bid discarded these so technically they would have won a trick in a way, but they use it as a bid. So they technically had no tricks won and they would have hit that zero bid and would have gotten seven points. But sadly, they did not do it. After that, you're gonna shuffle and play rounds per 
number of players and then you're going to rotate the start player and then whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins and that's how to play trick or bid so that is trick or bid and tip of the dice berg and before i do final thoughts i do want to say again john is a pal and i was sent these games a so huge 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 bias let's start off with trick or bid that one is it's really smooth for the most part like a, a pretty clear simple game where the hook of do i want this as my bid or do i want to take it as a trick is interesting there's definitely a lot more push your luck in this game than maybe the average trick taking game just because you're delaying that do i want this as my bid and what's cool is i don't I think I've seen this before, maybe I have, but that idea of that you can actually take a trick uh, that someone has played a zero into that isn't you, use it as your bid, and win a zero bid with actually taking a trick, if you, <laughs> if, if that makes sense. So it's interesting that, yeah, you can take a trick and still win a zero bid, kind of funny. But yeah, trick or bid, it's fluid, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense also why there's multiple, you know, threes and twos, or you know whatever the deck makeup has because you need those numbers for the bid. I do think the system of like it being like war and then going again is a little tough for some players to remember or just that flow of it, especially if it happens at the end because then it's like, oh, well, if that happens, then it's, it's wiped. Uh, there's just like, it's a very smooth game. And so having just those edge cases, even if they are handled, um, sometimes, is just a little bit of like a, oh, okay. But you know, just a play rate or something probably will help. But overall, just yeah, really smooth, good system that works. I do like the fact that you can also control what you play off trick. So if you're losing, you still control a little bit because what you play, the number could be possibly someone's bit. So maybe you don't want to play, even if you're short suited, you don't want to play like a, a four or a three or something that someone might be going for. And also if they, pick that early, then you know what they're going for and they have like one less option. So they're just taking tricks. So it's an interesting kind of bit as you go, but that bit of you as you go tension can just whittle down to nothing. So like if you wait too long to grab something, all the numbers that you might be going for might have already gone out in the trick play. So it's a really great system. Yeah, it works really well. So that is trick or bid. As to tip of the dice bird, yeah, we mentioned at the top, it's a lot like Sumida River. So that is must not follow climbing shedding if you think about it that way but that system now with more variability with dice works well i think there's some fun additions of cards that make it so oh now we're doing different melds and playing into the idea of dice being added i think john did a good job of making the dice matter a lot that's always a tough thing in trick taking games with dice is sometimes the dice like don't quite matter but the fact that you flipped it to where ones are the lowest even though that is a little bit like that might be maybe the toughest part of the game uh, uh some of the iconography but definitely the toughest part for me was switching it to like a climbing shedding game where actually it's a sinking shedding game <laughs> if if that is the new tagline for it but uh besides that where you just have to mentally be like oh yeah ones are low it works great it's cool uh, and almost necessary that ones uh, are the strongest because of the way the dice works. And it's great that the dice matter in the game in a cool way. Also, clever additions like uh, on pass, you can uh, take a, a die from the die pool if you want to. The may is great there. Also, the die pool gets rolled. It's obvious um, when playing that that can get kind of stagnant. So it is nice that it gets refreshed. And so everything feels great it's it's maybe sometimes a lot because like sumita river has static melt so after you play like a hand it kind of gets a little more obvious what you can do maybe in sumita river like it's it's kind of like that's it and i think the more interesting part of that game is balancing that with the different types of cards in tip of the diceberg though i think because you know dice is rolling and you're and you're changing what melds you can play between the hands and like the dice are always being re-rolled in the pool. There's just a lot of change and flux. And I think that's what this game really stands out as, is it's a lot of moving parts and a lot of adaptability because, you know, things are rolling. And I, I'd say if you like this game, you have to be comfortable with that. Just a lot of, a lot of some changes, a lot of growing hands, a lot of changing options. Um, 
So just keep that in mind is there's a lot in flux in this game, but there's still a good amount of planning and knowing how to shape your hand. So it's a lot of influx, but it's like options of influx. So it's like you may choose a die or when it gets rolled, you don't have to take anything from that pool or when things get added, you kind of know your hand at that point. So a lot of flex, but you definitely know kind of the situation that you're in. So it's maybe more variability at that point. But so that is tip of the iceberg and trick or bid. I'm really looking forward to playing eventually the other two games in the Kickstarter. I think John is doing a lot of great stuff, so I cannot see what comes out next. Thanks so much for watching, and here in a little bit, we're going to be actually talking about this little guy. So stay tuned. Should be a good time. All right. Catch you later. Bye.